Uh, this is the first of a uh, uh, set of two lectures. The, uh, the one by Eugenia Kalnay will be later in the week, and uh, this is sort of more of a general introduction. So, uh, just to motivate, uh, you know, uh, how many of you know what data assimilation is? Ah, okay. So this is a movie that was gener generously provided by Bill LaHose of DARK, uh, which is a data simulation research center uh, in uh, the United Kingdom. And what you're looking at is a satellite. So this is a view of the South Pole. Okay, I mean, you're looking uh, uh, here somewhere is a South Pole. Oops, I did something wrong. Okay, start it again, please. Okay, so, you know, the satellite is going around and providing you so-called uh, total ozone data and what on the left, and what you're looking at at the right is essentially uh, the model assimilation. There's a big... Uh, um, the general circulation model, a numerical weather prediction model that assimilates these very partial data on the left and turns them into the pictures on the right. And what you're actually looking at is the breakup of the ozone hole at the end of the southern winter. So you see there are days in, a few days in September. These are low ozone, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, low uh, temperature values, and this is sort of the polar vortex in which this stuff is trapped, and you see how it goes from one to two such centers. So you are converting very partial data into a pretty complete picture of what's going on in the atmosphere, oceans, or whatever else. Thank you very much. So please remember this is really what we're trying to do. We have partial and inaccurate data. We have a model on some sort of a regular grid, which uh, presumably is as accurate as we can make it, but still has errors. And we are trying to combine these two things into a picture of the evolving medium. Again, atmosphere, ocean, whatever. Uh, OK, thank you very much, Ilya. Okay. So, uh, you know, this is one of the first things that attracted me. Again, this is a joint math, climate, etc. meeting. Uh, my PhD was in mathematics. While I was a, at the Krant Institute, I became interested in these problems at NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, which is where Eugenia and I first met and uh, quite a while ago. And uh, so over uh, quite a few years, I worked with a lot of people, and this is joint work just recently with a number of them, and I won't even have the time to discuss all the work that we've been doing recently, where you can find more stuff uh, on the websites at the two uh, institutions that uh, I'm belonging to, the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris and the University of California in Los Angeles. I will only crack this joke once, not three times. They're both lovely places, but it's a long commute. Okay, so the outline data and meteorology, oceanography, and space physics, actually, which is one of the recent areas of application, in situ, meaning locally, traditional meteorological instruments, and remotely sensed, which is really what launched this area into the uh, attention of the community. Basic ideas, data types, and issues, how to combine data with models, so the stuff that on the left with the stuff on the right, transfer of information between variables and between regions, filters versus smoothers, stability of the forecast assimilation cycle, parameter estimation, both of model parameters and of noise parameters. What's essential in this thing is that both the data and the model have errors, and you model those as noise, but you still have to know things like the amplitude of the noise its distribution, etc at and below explicitly resolved grid scale, 
And amongst the novel areas of application, so again, space physics, so I have some reserve transparencies on the space physics shocks waves in solids, macroeconomics, paleoclimate, and what's called detection and attribution, or as uh, Alexis Sanar, a Franco-Argentinian researcher, likes to call DADA, detection and attribution via data assimilation, okay? And of course, some of you know that DADA was an art movement in the early 20th century, and so concluding remarks and bibliography. So out of this, I picked paleoclimate as the area of application to cover because Bala will be talking about that later. Uh, we had dinner last night, but I think he's actually not going to be here because he had some practical problems. So I'm afraid that he who was the intended audience primarily for selecting this particular area of application won't be around. Okay, concluding remarks and bibliography, where we came from and where we're going. Okay, so actually these uh, slides with a blue background come from Ilya teaching me how to do PowerPoint a few years ago, but then I found that the blue background is very expensive in terms of, of bits, so I've converted more recently to white. Anyhow, main issues, okay. So uh, in the geosciences, you have something called inverse modeling, not only the geosciences, but that somewhat preceded data assimilation, and which essentially doesn't look at the evolution of the medium. So that's why I'm saying here, the solid Earth stays put to be observed. You know, it's, uh, it's density structure and viscosity structure and, and other mechanical structures sort of don't change a lot on the time scale on which we're observing them, but the atmosphere, the oceans, and many other things do not stay put. In other words, they are evolving as we're looking at them, and that is really what the movie illustrated. So we have two types of information, direct, the actual observations, and indirect, the dynamics, which is really derived from past observations, but in the form of equations of motion, and as I said already, both have errors, so you want to combine the two in an optimal or in several optimal ways, you know, where optimality is defined, optimality is in the eye of the beholder. You have to define it mathematically in a precise way. So advanced data simulation methods provide such ways. Essentially, there are two complementary types of advanced methods. The sequential estimation, the Kalman filters and particle filters more recently, and control theory, the variational and adjoint methods again. So, um, uh, you know, when, when Eugenia and I started in this, uh, really there was none of this. Okay, so over the course of our active lifetimes, we've seen these evolve. The two types of methods are essentially equivalent for simple finite dimensional linear systems, the so-called duality principle, you know, deterministic control and stochastic estimation are duals of each other. Uh, but uh, the two types, uh, okay, for simple, okay, but their performance differs for large nonlinear systems in accuracy and computational efficiency, okay? And uh, that's really what the game is about. You want to study optimal combinations as well as improvements over currently well, currently operational, you know, again, changes with time, but I've just mentioned here optimal interpolation, which was a much more advanced method than successive corrections that used to be used for, formally for D var. I'm going to explain that later over 3D var. Pizazz, which is physical system, assimilation system, ensemble, Kalman filter, etc. There's, there's a huge literature on this now. And uh, again, uh, the University of Maryland would host the next uh, World Meteorological Organization uh, Symposium on the Assimilation of Data in the Atmosphere and Oceans. Okay, so I'm going to start with the data uh, in situ and remotely sensed. This is actually a picture taken out of a book that was published uh, on, uh, over 30 years ago, edited by Leonard Benson, myself, and Erlan Shalian, uh, based on a symposium, as it, uh, uh, sorry, a seminar, as they call them at the European Center, which are really sort of summer schools. And this is uh, the many types of atmospheric data. 
you know, in some sense, the atmosphere is the most observed fluid there is. And in some sense, as I'm going to tell you, it's sort of embarrassing that we're doing so poorly with all these data. Sorry, Eugenia. <laughs> Oh, yeah, right. Very good. <laughs> you know, Henny actually had admin uh, responsibility for a number of years. She did marvels for what was called at the time the National Meteorological Center of the U.S., which is now called NSIP, the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. And, um, well, you know, I climb, so I need very accurate weather at a very high resolution. So, <laughs> yeah, but we are doing great to a large extent due to the things that she did at NMC before she moved on to, to academic positions. Okay, so anyhow, you know, the data come from drifting buoys which provide surface uh, pressures, and these are the numbers of such observations per synoptic period. In other words, per 12 hours, cloud drift winds, Aircraft, you know, you can see where people tend to fly. Ship and land surface, which provide both surface temperatures and pressures. And then the really interesting stuff that, that kicked this into, into space, polar orbiting satellites, uh, okay, uh, balloons, radiosons, which are the conventional way of looking at this, and uh, finally geostationary satellites. Uh, so the total number of observations is of the order of 10 to the 5 or more scalars per half day or day. And this gives you essentially 100 uh, observations per significant degree of freedom per significant time interval. Okay, so this was when this was done at the time of the so-called FIGI, which is a second order acronym, the first global GARP experiment. The first order acronym GARP is not the novel that you've all read, but it's a global atmospheric research program. Okay, and then when there wasn't a second one, the name was converted from FIGI to GWE, the global weather experiment. Okay. Now, in, this is what it looks like more recently. So that was, I forget exactly, from a date uh, somewhere in 1981, January or something I can't read anymore here. And this is something more recent. And uh, this indicates something else, that these data, in principle, the syst there's something called quality control, which now the system tends to do, the data simulation slash forecasting system tends to do more and more by itself, but which traditionally used to be manual, done manually. You know, uh, green is clear, okay. Uh, 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 yellow is quality control history, which eliminates five. And uh, fi this is qu uh, quality control excluded, which in this case is zero. There are a few yellow ones, but no red one. You know, you have to be careful of, with this stuff because there's a very well-known story about the same ozone hole that I was showing you. The NMC at the time threw out a lot of data as being totally implausible until somebody figured out that they're actually correct. Uh, yeah. Okay. We used to, you know, there was a little, I mean, for a while we shared certain responsibilities at NASA's uh, first Goddard Institute for Space Study, then Global, uh, um, then uh, Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. And there used to be a war between NASA and NMC because NASA wanted satellites and NMC wanted computers. So they tended to prove that everything that we did was wrong, except that eventually they were wrong, but then, you know, uh, Eugenia moved from across the Beltway or something from NASA to NMC and taught them how to do it right. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is all history. Okay, now ocean data. In the past, these were so-called um, uh, 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 mechanic better thermograph cast, you know, stuff, instruments that you just threw overboard and hold them back in, okay? And um, if I get too agitated, I'm going to use my, uh, lose my batteries here. Okay. So, oops, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, 
So, uh, and these tended actually after a while to be less and less because in the meantime you had expendable bathythermographs which you only threw in and transmitted the data back and you didn't have to haul back in. But in any case, the total number of oceanographic observations versus meteorological observations was about 10 to the minus 4 in the past and it's still going to be about a factor of 10 less in the future. So oceanographers are doing more poorly, but then of course the difference between present and future is again the fact that they got satellite data, you know, uh, altimetry for sea level, scatterometry for surface winds and sea state, and acoustic tomography for temperature and density inside the ocean. The reason that you have much fewer, will have much fewer data for the ocean in the future as well is because uh, as two leading oceanographers, Walter Monk and Carl Wunsch, pointed out in a famous paper about 20 years ago, the ocean is not transparent to electromagnetic radiation, which the air is. But still, you have at least a lot of surface data and some in-depth data. Okay, now just to give you an idea of space physics that I won't have the time to discuss in detail, but again, you know, basically, uh, Again, space physics underwent the same kind of transition that oceanography did, you know, within the last few years that oceanography did about 20 years ago when, uh, for instance, Alan Robinson asked me to lecture about this at Harvard. You know, the, you started having models and you started having satellites. So in the past, you know, an, um, a space physicist used to spend the entire career from, from, um, uh, from PhD thesis to uh, promotion to full professor, preparing an instrument and collecting data from that instrument in the same way that oceanographers, you know, would prepare an instrument, go to sea, and uh, I think the batteries are going to stay in even if this falls out. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, uh, have a cruise, come back and write papers for the rest of their lives. So now, that so you have two decades ago, these are the so-called Van Allen radiation belts. You had just one satellite. Now you have, again, a whole constellation. Actually, constellation is an experiment, but I mean by extension, you start having multiple satellites for space physics as well. So that's why we've been doing some data simulation for that recently, but I won't have the time to talk about that today. But you can find it on the websites that I indicated. So, basic ideas, data types and issues, how to combine data with models. Okay, so now, for now as Monty Python likes to say, the, you know, the group, now for something entirely different, we're actually going to have some equations. First, some very simple equations, and then they will become slightly more complicated. Okay, so let's say we want to estimate T, the temperature of this room, based on the readings T1 and T2 of two thermometers. And by a linear estimate, T hat, the estimate is linear combination alpha, alpha 1 T1 plus alpha 2 T2. The interpretation will be that actually the T1 is the first guess of a numerical forecast model started yesterday of what the temperature in the room or somewhere else should be today. And T2 is the actual observation at the time at which I'm trying to make this estimate which might be a radio sound or a satellite, etc. And T hat is going to be T super A for objective analysis. This is again comes from the history of the subject. I won't tell you the story because I want to move on to some real stuff. So why this is called objective analysis, etc. If the observations T1 and T2 are unbiased and we want T hat to be unbiased, then the sum of the coefficients has to be equal to 1. Okay, and that's ca called a convex linear combination. So you can also write it as t hat is equal to t1 plus alpha 2 t2 minus t1. So this is sequential updating in time. Okay, if t1 and t2 are uncorrelated and have known standard deviations, all of which are not correct assumptions for what we're doing with, you know, inverting temperatures, etc., in the atmosphere, but it's a good place to start. Then you have, you call A1 the inverse of uh, sigma 1 squared and A2 the inverse of sigma 2 squared and A are the accuracies. I learned this little 
trick from Chuck Leith, and you can write the minimum variance estimator, which is also called blue, that's why I use the color blue, best linear unbiased estimator. Okay, so t hat is t1 plus this correction. Okay, so what the model told me the temperature should be plus this correction, which is A2 divided by A1 plus A2. The accuracy of the observation divided by the sum of the accuracies of the first guess and the observation times T2 minus T1. And the accuracy of this estimate is A1 plus A2, which is larger than the larger one of A1 and A2. So this says that data simulation is always good for you. Okay? Now, the more general form of what I just told you, so I hope everybody is with me to up to this point, this now becomes slightly more complicated. You have the following. You have the true evolution, which is deterministic plus stochastic. X, which is a state vector, remember it has 10 to the 7 variables, okay? At time t i 1 plus 1, okay, so that's a true one, is the model, this is not a matrix, it's a nonlinear model of xt uh, time t1 plus an error, which you assume you can model as a stochastic process, and the variance, okay, qt is the expected value of uh, this uh, uh, thing. Now, from this you get two things. You get on the one hand the observations, and on the other hand you get your deterministic prediction. So let's start with the observation. Okay? You have an observation Y, okay, which has an observational operator of the true state, which you don't know, plus again some errors which again you assume <coughs> are unbiased, okay, they are centered or they have mean zero and they have a variance, give covariance matrix given by this and this thing which was, I'm reminding you, this little was this stuff, the T2 minus T1, okay, so here it is called the innovation vector, it's the difference between the actual observation and what uh, happens if you apply the observational, the observation operator to the forecast, okay? So the thing is that typically this Y has a lower dimension than the full state. You know, it's that satellite rotating there, which is very partial observations, okay? Now what happens in the prediction is what happens in your computer, okay? So X forecast is M of the X analysis, your estimate at the previous time, and the covariance of this forecast is this stuff, okay? So it's the covariance at the of the estimate at the previous time, to which you apply these capital M's are now linearizations, they are matrices, they are linearizations of the full model, plus this Q which you assume you know, but you don't, so you have to do something else next, but that's more complicated. And now you are combining, so you are going from here, you are trying to go from here to here, you use the observations and you use the prediction to get the update which is probabilistic. So this is now the equation that I showed you here, okay? Except in matrix form and with all these other things happening, the X objective analysis is given by the X forecast, the T1, plus this K, K for Kalman, which is in this matrix context, this thing here. Okay, the accuracy of the observations divided by the accuracy of the estimate uh, of the two estimates. So K applied to the innovation vector or also called observational residual. PA is given by this formula, which is the identity matrix minus K. So K is a rectangular matrix. It is not a square matrix. K is a rectangular matrix 
which says, uh, you know, which takes the observations, say with dimension p, which is much less than d, the full dimension, into the full dimension. Okay, 1 minus k applied to h, again the linearization of the observational operator, multiplying the pf. So this looks again on the face of it, you know, you're not guaranteed that this is a positive definite matrix, okay? It is now a square matrix, k multiplied by h, okay? h is, is p by d and, and k is d by p, so this is now a square matrix, okay? Uh, but it's not guaranteed to be positive definite, but it sort of looks like indeed the accuracy of the result will be better than the accuracy of the first guess or of the observations. And k is given by this formula, which looks awful, except that it is just this. Okay? So if you haven't gotten what's on the second transparency, just remember what was on the first transparency. Okay? And uh, uh, subject to various uh, uh, this, is, this is given by differentiating P, A, with respect to K. Okay. So... What does that mean? Pardon me? Uh, what, what is the physical meaning of that? Of the linearization? No, of the constraint. Uh, oh, you're, you're just trying to get the best K. So you're differentiating, you're, you're trying to minimize P, A. So how do, you how do you minimize? Well, by, taking, by setting the derivative equal to zero. Again, in this vector space. Uh, uh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Not physical at all, just standard calculus. Okay, so transfer of information between variables and regions. So this is really the key. You are measuring certain variables for which you have instruments and you might measure them with greater accuracy or at all in certain regions and not in others. And this is really what our contribution was in, uh, you know, 30 years ago, because at the time, you know, Kalman did this when he was working at Martin in Maryland, you know, for launching, I mean, uh, uh, controlling missiles, okay? Missiles have six variables, okay? Position, velocity, and sorry, angle. Uh, maybe six. And we have 10 to the 5 at the time when we we're doing this. So although there was some formal work about applying this to partial differential equations, it wasn't clear at all what was happening. First of all, much of that work was done by engineers who like to call things they do theorems, but they were not correct. You know, uh, you can't even define noise that is white in space and time. Okay? So, you know, basically there were papers which said, oh, you know, just call it infinite dimensional space and it's going to work, except it won't. So the real contribution was understanding this business about transfer of information between variables and regions. Okay, so basic concepts for a simple biotropic model. So anyhow, I don't know how many people here know the shallow water equations. A few, okay. Well, Sorry, can't make it any simpler, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know. I think Einstein said, gotta make everything as simple as you can, but not any simpler. Okay, so shallow water equations, one dimension linearized about the state, which is capital U, so U is velocity along a circle of latitude, so-called zonal velocity, uh, in, uh, along a meridian zero, and phi is a so-called geopotential, which uh, is essentially just a measure of the height of a surface of equal pressure, okay, subject to this so-called geostrophic constraint. F is, is um, the Coriolis parameter, and so U, capital U, and capital Phi have to satisfy this relationship. F U equal minus Phi sub Y. It comes from the fact that due to the rotation of the Earth and to Mr. Coriolis, actually flow in in, uh, on the large scales in atmospheres and oceans is not from large pressure to low pressure, but perpendicular to the pressure gradient. 
So the equations are these, lowest, so little u is the difference between the actual velocity and capital U. So the linearized equation u sub t plus cap u, u, u x plus phi x minus f v equals zero. So this is the Coriolis force here, f v and here f u. And this is, so these are the momentum equations and this is the conservation of mass or um, uh, whatever. Uh, so this system of partial differential equations is discretized by finite differences with periodic boundary conditions. So this is, think of this as being the 45th parallel north and it has uh, equal continents and oceans. So in the simplified model, North America and Eurasia have the same extent. And furthermore, Tokyo is equal to New York by periodicity, okay? So, and H, K is the, obse uh, so the observation, uh, the observational um, uh, operator, in this case a matrix, in this linear case, observations at so-called synoptic times every 12 hours, over land only. So they're only over half the domain here and here, okay? So this was essentially done in the uh, PhD thesis of two of my first uh, students. Steve Cohn and Dick D, and uh, summarized in a review paper that went into that book out of which I showed you that uh, picture. So what does a, con a conventional network mean? Okay, uh, the, the, it's just what I told you, you just have radio sounds, so you just have observations of phi, u, and v over land. Okay, and this is now the expected root mean square error over land in time. The time is in days, so this is 0, 1, etc., to 10. And let's say you have a certain large area in u, v, and phi at the beginning, and over land, you knock it down every time you observe, because you observe everything. Essentially, you can just think that you substitute the values that you observed for what you forecast. But then, in between observations, the error grows. It grows for two reasons. One is because there's that Q, you are pumping noise into it, okay? And the other one is, and that's the point about transfer of information between regions, that lack of information or inaccuracy is coming in from over the ocean. Anyhow, over time, this settles into an asymptotically periodic solution, okay? You are managing to control the error, okay? over the entire domain by observing only over half the domain. What happens over the ocean? You start with the same large errors. You knock it down a little bit at observation times just because, you know, you have extrapolation from that K. The K will also transfer information instantaneously. Okay, but only to adjacent points, or will only give big weights to adjacent points. But again, this settles in the, into an asymptotic state with a larger error. So this is actually the, the error in the, in the observations, okay, this error over here. And this is over the entire domain, averaging over these two pictures. So now, uh, we're looking here at relative weight of observational versus model errors. The P infinity is QR plus the, uh, divided by Q plus R, forget for a moment this stuff. This is exactly what was written here, okay? So if you, if uh, uh, the only correction comes from the fact that uh, there is uh, something about the numerical differencing and this psi is the symbol of uh, your numerical scheme, the, okay, won't go into the details. So if Q is zero, in other words, if there is no uh, model error, if your model is perfectly accurate, it says that P infinity will be zero. So this asymptotic state will actually be exact. What this says is that this sequential estimation, this data simulation, this common filtering, in this simple linear case, et cetera, essentially manages to stop the motion. In other words, 
it's exactly the same as if you were measuring the temperature of this room again and again and again, and the error would go down like 1 over square root n, where n is the number of times you've measured. So you can take care of the dynamics. Okay? So now, uh, if q is not equal to 0, in other words, if your model is not perfectly accurate, which Eugenia tells you will still not be the case at any point in time because of subgrid scale, etc., you will have the following situation. If you have good observations, in other words, r is much smaller than q, then p infinity will just be equal to r. Okay, so again, you manage to sweep away the dynamics, okay? It's just going to be equal to the error in the observations. On the other hand, if you have poor observations, if your model now is much more accurate than your observations, the result will be Q modified by this little thing which has to do with the numerical differencing, okay? And so this uh, always provided that your numerical scheme is stable, P infinity is going to be less than R and Q. So again, this is exactly what I told you here. Okay? So now you'll say, ah, come on. I mean, you know, the standard reaction amongst meteorologists these days that lots more and more people work with big models is, yes, but this is a, this is a toy model. Go away. You know, this can't be true for the really big, heavy stuff that we're working with. Except that it is. So this is from an experiment carried out, uh, again, at the Goddard Space Flight uh, uh, Center by this uh, meteorology group uh, after FIGI, okay, after that thing happened. And what you're looking at is at the map of the root mean square error at uh, this is close to the tropopause, not quite the tropopause, but close to the tropopause. So you will recognize there are two kinds of experiments. Uh, one in which you only use so-called conventional observations, or no SAT. And in this case, you see that things are accurate over the continents and lousy over the oceans. That's what I told you at the beginning. Okay? Now, what happens if you have all those things flying around in Figgy? Okay, what you see is that essentially, the, the whole thing gets smoothed out. In other words, um, the, uh, you no longer have error. Okay, sorry, I, what I forgot to tell you is, sorry, sorry. Uh, at six hours, so, you know, uh, which is actually subsynoptic, but now we have a lot of observations where we're looking at, you, you have a lot of, you have large errors coming in from the ocean a lot it, on the western part of the American continent. This area is wiped out when you use the satellite data. Okay? So this says, you know, misinformation is no longer advected because you are, you know, you are in the situation that I described in that simple idealized case. Okay, filters and smoothers. I think I'm going to skip these in the interest of time. So we started at uh, 10 past, right? right. Uh, okay. I think I'm going to skip this. Well, l let me see whether, OK. Uh, I'll, I'll just show you this. Uh, th this goes back to, to Norbert Wiener, the book that he published in 1949. The main products of any kind of estimation. He didn't, at that time, didn't know about sequential estimation. He was just doing things that uh, statist purely statistically. You know, the, um, uh, what's called sometimes the state vector approach to estimation that I showed you before, also known as Kalman filtering, etc., came indeed um, uh, about uh, so this, uh, uh, 11 or 12 years later. So this is now your state. This is time. This is the interval over which you have observations. You know, um, green comes from a verse by Goethe, which I will tell you over coffee. Um, so uh, uh, you have observations over this. So filtering, okay, filtering is what I described. You, are, you have observations from the past, and you are trying to estimate your state at the present. Smoothing is trying to infer the state of the entire system from the partial observations over this entire interval. And prediction 
is going into the future past the moment when you have observations. And actually, one of the most interesting results of this, of, of what I showed you before, is that the, the, only, the best thing you can do for prediction into the future is to estimate the state at the present. You know, it looks sort of trivial, but it, it, it's non-trivial, and it can be demonstrated in under certain simplified circumstances. So, you know, I, 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 we can discuss this during question period. Okay, so there are various kinds of smoothers, uh, fixed interval and fixed lag. I won't go into that. Uh, we did some work that's described in this paper in the monthly weather review with colleagues at, at JPL. Um, the only thing that I uh, wanted to show you from, uh, uh, so we call this uh, the backward sequential smoother, BSS. Uh, not to be confused with BS, which is something else in North American uh, slang. Uh, what I wanted to show you here simply is that there's more and more interest in what's called particle filters of which the so-called ensemble common filter is just a very simple illustration. So the real part of what we're trying to do these days, you see, uh, basically what I showed you here is just trying to estimate the mean state and the variance. So in other words, the first two moments of the current and future distributions. In fact, we understand more and more that because of the nonlinearity of atmospheric and oceanic processes, you need uh, higher order moments. And these particle filters, in principle, are trying to compute the entire distribution. Okay, but I will skip these results in the interest of, of showing you this, which I, I think, again, is, is really cute for at least uh, for the more pa mathematical part of the audience. Before showing you that, I'm just going to show you very simply here the error components in what's called the forecast analysis cycle. So at an operational center, you keep doing this, estimating the present state, forecasting into the future, estimating again the present day, the next day, etc. And that's called the forecast analysis cycle. So again, in, 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 sch uh, in schematic writing, the, the first guess error is equal to the analysis error from the past, plus delta t, your interval, twice a PAA, this is the identical twins error growth. So in other words, the error growth uh, for the same model but with slightly different initial data, plus Q, which is the modeling error. Okay? So this is a general equation, and uh, in, uh, in uh, linear approximation in, in finite differences, you know, the psi that I used before is just e to the a delta t, again, approximately 1 plus a delta t, okay? And so the root mean square error, which is a square root of pf, starts out a square root of pa. It increases exponentially for a linear perfect model, okay? Or for small time steps, even for a nonlinear one, a being the linearization. The square root, this leads to uh, the standard uh, Einstein 1905, you know, increase uh, of square root Q times T. And so the real model will essentially grow like A plus Q, again in quotation marks, and it will re the, reach the climatological error after a certain number of days, and which is called essentially the predictability time. Now, uh, okay, a simulation of observation stability of uh, stability considerations. This goes back to some work that uh, Anna Trevisan and some of her students, Alberto Carassi and Franco Boldi, did earlier, but we sort of clarified this in a paper in Chaos. Uh, so here's a free system dynamics in so called sequential discrete formulation. Um, I'll try to explain in a few words uh, what breeding is. This is also something that goes back to Eugenia and some of her collaborators. The forecast state xf at n plus 1 is m times uh, applied to cap x at time n, a for the estimate. The so-called corresponding perturbative or tangent linear equation, so in other words, the change in xf is the linearized version of this acting on, on the linearized version of that. 
Now, the observationally forced system dynamics, sequential discrete formulation, is this. So this basically goes back to what I told you some slides ago in that uh, slide that we discussed for a while. Okay, it's this equation essentially that we're discussing here. And I told you something that it, at least on the, on the face of it, it looks like it will lead to smaller errors. And this is indeed the case under suitable circumstances. Okay, so here is the xa, 1 minus kh applied to this, plus k, the gain matrix applied to the observations. This is just another way of writing. Uh, we don't have, we were told that we will have a blackboard, but we don't have one, so I can't, I can't do this. But basically, this is just another way of rewriting, regrouping the terms so that instead of having this thing here going with that, you know, this is k y naught minus k h ta da ta. It's written in this way, so you see that this one minus k h is now the dynamics of the um, updates. Okay. So the matrix y k h is expected in general to have a stabilizing effect, as I showed you. The free system instabilities which dominate the error growth during the forecast step can be reduced during the analysis step. Okay? And so we apply this to two models. One is the so-called Lorentz 1996 model that I think Eugenia will be talking about uh, in her talk later today, right? You're going to mention that work with, no? Okay. Never mind, lots of people have used this model, uh, which is uh, points around the, also around the circle of latitude and different assimilation algorithms. So basically, it what, okay, I will skip to this. Um, what we're looking at is the leading uh, Lyapunov exponents of this model with 40 variables, okay? Red is a free system, so this is zero. So the free system has, is chaotic because it has a number of positive Lyapunov exponents, small but still existing, while these others, I won't go into the details about the different assimilation schemes. You know, the trick is that you need fewer and fewer observations as you apply better and better assimilation. But all of these lie entirely below zero. So this says that even in the case of a nonlinear chaotic system, you can, if you do things right, stabilize the system. In other words, get that p infinity, which will be finite and as small as possible. Okay. Uh, and again, we applied this to a much more realistic model, a so-called uh, uh, quasi-geostrophic periodic channel model. Uh, uh, with various assimilation algorithms, and we're able to compute the leading exponent, which for the free system is free system 0.3 days to the minus one, so doubling time two days. And then the various assimilation algorithms give you this one is almost zero, and uh, here it is negative, and you can compute the Kaplan York dimension, which goes again down from 65 here to one, and then obviously to zero in the other case. Uh, now I'm coming to the novel area of application, which is paleoclimate, okay? And again, uh, I'm sorry that uh, uh, Bala isn't here, but maybe I'll discuss this with him privately. Parameter estimation for energy balance model with memory. So an energy balance model is something that is trying to just compute the temperature by uh, ignoring the details of the velocity field. And basically it can be written as for the mathematicians, as a nonlinear parabolic partial differential equation. T now is temperature, uh, partial derivative with respect to time of the temperature in such a volume is given by a diff the leading term mathematically is this diffusion term, the second derivative of so respect to x shows up. And uh, physically, the interesting part is that it is driven by the difference between the incoming radiation minus the outgoing radiation modified by the so-called planetary albedo, uh, planetary reflectivity, 
and essentially by the greenhouse effect. Okay, so this was actually uh, an outcome of my PhD thesis at the Courant Institute, but then the delay effects were introduced in a paper with my first PhD student who was actually at Columbia and then an asso other associate at GIS. And more recently, so the work that I'm describing here is with a group in southern France um, at Avignon, and uh, it's actually not just submitted, it's essentially accepted. And bas basically what we, are, what we are trying to do is the same thing that Bala is trying to do, except that we are trying to take into account explicitly uncertainty in the timing of the observations. Part of the problem with paleoclimate data is not just that you have only proxies, you can't fly satellites into the past, so you have so-called proxies for temperature and for other ice volume, etc. Okay, this is for instance a history of ice volume over the last million years, uh, which goes back for a while. This is, it can be dated to some extent by the magnetic reversal between Brunesse Normal in which are now and Matuyama reversed, which is roughly at this point 700 uh, uh, kilo years, 100 thousands of years ago. But each, not only are we uncertain, I mean, these are really uh, oxygen isotope ratios converted into ice volume. Not only are we uncertain about the vertical axis, but we're also uncertain about the horizontal axis. Okay? So um, uh, the memory, so now the memory effects. Uh, have to do why are, are the memory effects because in this equation which only takes into account uh, temperature uh, the albedo so the reflectivity uh, changes in albedo over time are dominated by um, uh, changes in the ice volume you know ice has very high reflectivity but on the other hand the ice volume is not an instantaneous function of temperature, uh, it takes uh, 100,000 years to, to build up, a, or 10,000 years or whatever, to build up uh, a serious ice sheet which is three or four kilometers thick. So that's what the memory effects are doing in this business. Okay, so now you have to write down with this so-called distributed memory effect which is, comes in an integral form. Okay, you are going, this is still the same, the diffusion, so I forgot to tell you that the diffusion term here has to do with the exchange of heat between such latitude belts. Okay, and um, uh, so uh, this net radiation balance is now effect affected by the past history of the ice volume and this also shows up on the left hand high side because it affects the heat capacity of the system. So, um, uh, you have initial data for something that's a functional PD. Since you have delays, you have to give it, uh, uh, initial data not just at the point in time, but over the entire extent over which you have to integrate the history in this term, you know, from minus tau to zero. So, you prescribe those, okay? And what we want to, uh, to uh, do is essentially to determine this albedo function which comes in here, okay? So it turns out that mathematically you can prove that this coefficient in the ab absence of uh, errors in, uh, in the model, uh, sorry, in the um, uh, given exact initial data, sorry, the model is perfect in this case, uh, again, an assumption, but uh, the initial data are not, assuming uh, um, exact data at a single point between equator and pole, or a single marine sediment core, if you wish, a point in the, over some interval, the coefficient is determined uniquely, but we are interested now in the more realistic situation in which a statistical model of the observation process is needed. So, assume a certain prior distribution and that the unknown coefficient also has a prior distribution and we're going to do Bayesian stuff so we're going to get uh, these distributions after the observations have been made. Data will be provided at only three sites. So we only have three cores. Okay? Uh, we don't have observations at every point. So again, it's, you know, like that satellite I showed you out of Bill LaHose's uh, movie. Okay? 
And so the mechanistic statistical model now includes a specific energy balance model with memory effects, which looks like this. So here comes the memory effect, okay? This is a linearized version of the outgoing radiation, in other words, including uh, a greenhouse. Uh, uh, so the form of the albedo is known, but we need uh, parameter values. So basically, if this tau is small, you expect mathematically that the situation will not be that different from the one in the absence of delays. So the solution tends rapidly, you see, you start out, so time goes from zero upwards in units of uh, thousands of years, okay, in this case. So it goes from this to something like this. So it tends to stationarity, the longer the transient with large amplitude as the lag increases. So here it goes very quickly. Here there's some periodicity because it, before it settles into the final state. And so, uh, sorry, the, uh, sorry, the proxy records at these three sites uh, have two sources of uncertainty, as I told you. Uh, one is the measurement of the temperature, okay, um, at time t and location sk. So the location is known because you send the ship there and you take the core or you drill in the ice sheet. So the date of t is actually itself a random variable. And the model is order preserving. In other words, uh, you don't know the sedimentation rate, which you don't, but you do know the order, you know, the, the, the bioturbation or whatever happens in your cores doesn't invert the order of the measurements. And the variance increases as we sink further into the past. So these are known facts. And now the parameter estimation for the energy balance model, okay. What you are seeing here are uh, essentially the actual temperatures versus the measured temperatures at the three sites. So one, two, three. So it's the actual versus uh, the measured temperatures. And um, uh, the errors uh, so this is for the smaller delay, this is for the larger delay. It's clear that the errors are larger in this case, uh, which results in a more irregular solution. And again, we seek this alpha by a Bayesian approach with Monte Carlo, uh, with Mar uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, MCMC. MC. And basically the final result is that uh, what you see in black are the observations, uh, the red is the mean, and these things are percentiles of the distribution that we're seeking. So again, this is the alpha over the interval. So anyhow, the result is that you can do this in a systematic way, which people have been doing by all sorts of empirical, you know, trial and error methods that I won't go into because they include something that I'm not terribly happy about, the so-called orbital tuning, where it's a matter of carts and horses, and uh, okay, it's a, it's a long story. Okay, so concluding remarks and bibliography, where we came from. Okay, so evolution of data simulation. Uh, this is, again, a, uh, from one of the contributions of that 1981 volume, what the various numerical weather prediction, operational or numerical weather prediction centers were doing in the various countries, Australia, Canada, et cetera, and where things like successive corrections or piecewise linear or various other things. So what I call the, early, the transition from early to mature phase of data simulation numerical Weather prediction, so there was no Kalman filter introduced in this paper, 19, no adjoint or variational method introduced by Louis and Derber, Tels 85, and Ledimé and Talagran, 1986. Okay, so again, this is taken out of that book, and it's also reproduced in this review paper with Paola Malanotti, it's only uh, 10 years later. Uh, the various methods, I owe these slides to Eugenia, who once gave a talk in Paris uh, about this. So this is 3D VAR, again, I'm running out of time, so I don't want to go into details, but you can ask me afterwards. 
uh, the difference between 3D VAR, in other words, at the fixed time versus 4D VAR, where you do take into account the distribution of observations over that observational time, which I showed you before. Extended Kalman filter, which is this version of the uh, Kalman filter applied to nonlinear problems in which you linearize the, op the uh, um, equations for the covariances, but you keep the full nonlinearity for the state itself. Uh, then ensemble Kalman filter in which you, this simple particle filter in which you launch a number of uh, uh, forecasts and you try to compute the covariance from the result of those forecasts. So this is just to illustrate uh, a couple of the very many advanced methods available today. So uh, this is a table out of the review paper with uh, Paula, which uh, shows the duality principle for uh, linear equations between, again, the uh, linear Kalman filter and um, um, uh, with, of course, stochastic perturbations and um, uh, optimal control. Uh, so here I have this cautionary no note as what I call the pantheistic view of data simulation variation is roughly the same as Kalman filter. 3 and 4D VAR roughly the same as 3 and 4D PISAS or ensemble Kalman filter. Fashionable to claim it's all the same, but it's not. And you know, this is a quote which has been attributed to many people and which is slightly modified. You know, God is in everything, but the devil is in the details. Uh, so where we are going, Computational advances, hardware, more computational power, CPU throughput, large and faster memory, three tier software, better numerical implementations of algorithms. So this is what, again, what you're going to probably hear from Eugenia uh, in a couple of days. Automatic adjoints, I didn't have the time really to talk about that. Various sparse matrix algorithms, better ensemble and particle filters, efficient parallelization, etc. And so the big, one of the big questions in operational numerical weather prediction is how much data simulation versus forecast. Uh, you know, all of this costs money. Data, I mean, data simulation, because you have to compute some approximation to these matrices, uh, requires the equivalent of several forecasts. So how, how do you try to balance this? So again, design integrated observing forecast simulation systems. Uh, Observing system design, well, this is uh, just a couple of results here. Need no more independent observations than degrees of freedom to be tracked, which is certainly not the case in, numerical, in, in operational systems. So there are a number of results here uh, that um, I'm citing. The cost of advanced data simulation is much less than that of instruments and platforms. At best use data simulation, this is of course tongue in cheek, at best use data simulation instead of instruments and platforms, the worst use data simulation to determine really which instruments and platforms advanced so-called observing system simulation experiments. The truth of the matter is that this is being done more and more, but still the instruments that get launched into space are determined by engineers and not by meteorologists or oceanographers. I mean, you've been a civil servant for long enough, right, to, <laughs> I hope, confirm that. So uh, use any observation to forward modeling is po possible. If you have an observing operator e H, satellite images, 4D observations, pattern recognition in observations and in phase-based statistics, this again is starting to uh, be implemented. So um, uh, conclusion, theoretical concepts play a useful role in devising better practical algorithms and vice versa. You know, much of my work on this was motivated uh, 30 years ago by, by having to cope what was actually being done by NASA at that time in, in data simulation. Judicious choices of observations and method can stabilize the forecast assimilation cycle, trade off between cost of observations and of data assimilation. Uh, I won't go into this ocean versus atmosphere, we don't have the time. Uh, just to tell you that there is now not just a dark, but a DART data simulation research testbed. This was the cover of an uh, issue of BAMS, uh, data simulation research testbed, uh, um, located at least um, centered at, at NCAR. And here's what I call the data simulation maturity index of a field. Pre-data simulation, few data, poor models. The theoretician says, science is truth, don't bother me with the facts. The observer experimental says, don't ruin my beautiful data with your lousy model. Then early data simulation, beta da better data, so-so models. 
stick it in, in other words, the observations, things like direct insertion or nudging, advanced data simulation, plenty of data, fine models, the, this duality, but then also so-called the unscented Kalman filter, particle filters, etc. And what I call post-industrial data simulation, go from satellite images directly to weather forecasts and climate movies, maybe. Okay, if some people here are young enough, maybe. So I'm just reminding you of this, uh, of this uh, thing that I showed you before. So uh, parameter estimates, uh, you know, uh, I've completed the picture with some of the other things. Uh, distribute all this over the web to scientists and the person in the street or on the information superhighway and in a general way, have fun. And uh, so we've come a long way in 30 years. Some advances are laborious and incremental, uh, but others are fresh and exciting. A lot of new areas of application, including uncertainty quantification, and say biology, geomagnetism, whatever multi-scale and multi-model problem, technological advances both pose new problems, massive data sets, higher resolution, and help solve them. Overall, it's a brave new world in which data models actively speak to each other, and we do so to both, uh, so enjoy. And here is a cartoon from the New Yorker. Miss Peterson, may I go home? I can't assimilate any more data today. <laughs> Okay, so here are some general references and here are some more specific references, but again, normally this will be, I think, uh, be distributed over the web, so thank you very much. <laughs>